My camera is on. Are you ready? I guess. I'm a little nervous, but yeah. <laughs> what is it like to be a quadruple amputee? It's hard. It's extremely hard. Um, I had to learn how to do everything. I had to learn how to walk. I had to learn how to brush my hair, brush my teeth, give myself a shower. Um, I, that's just the only way I can explain it is it's hard. How old were you when you had all your limbs amputated? Um, it was in 2019, so I was 40. 40 years old. My kids were in their senior year of high school, and little did we know COVID was fixing to hit. When I first came in your house, you said that your, your cute little puppy over there is a, a PTSD puppy. Can I ask you about that? Yeah. Are you actually diagnosed with PTSD? Yes. What is that? Uh, where does that stem from? Tell me all about it. Um, they said that it stems from just going through the traumatic experience of losing all four of my limbs um, and then the depression with it. What's this puppy's name? Mazzy. Tell me how Mazzy has helped you. Mazzy helps me. She just cheers me up. Say hi. I call her mama's baby. It was very, very depressing. I tried to be positive and I tried to think of a positive outcome and I relied a lot on my faith that I had a less than a 5% chance of surviving and I survived so God has a purpose for me. And that's what I relied on getting home but at the same time it was still very depressing because I thought my life was over. How am I going to function? You know, I was a mom and I, I had a full-time job and everything was just gone. I felt like it was just taken away. She sleeps with me and she does everything. What's it like to have a puppy who hugs you and loves you? It's sweet. It's great. I never really had one before that, you know, that was just for me. And she is, <laughs> she's for me. I could not bathe myself. I couldn't clean up after myself when I'd go to the bathroom. Um, my husband and my daughter had to give me showers. It, it was pretty depressing. I thought I was useless. I felt useless and that there was no way that I was ever going to learn to take care of myself on my own. And I felt like a burden, especially to my daughter. My son didn't really do too much in it because, you know, I'm his mom. But my daughter, she did a lot and I felt like a big burden to her. I felt like an even bigger burden to my husband. If you are feeling that um, PTSD symptom of depression and you get a hug like this, does your mood change instantly? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's, it's you know, some people look at them and say they're just dogs. But, no, they're family. She provides me support emotionally when I need it. She just makes my little old heart happy. How does she help with the PTSD? Well, there's days that it's still really hard. Um, there's days where a, a memory will pop up somewhere and I'll be like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And there's days where I just cry about it. And she just, it's like she knows. She just comes and gets in my lap and she just... She curls right up on my shoulder and is like, I, I tell people she hugs me. She puts her leg, one leg on each side and she just hugs me. <laughs> She's like, I don't know what's going on. How long will she uh, cuddle you and hug you for? Oh, as long as I hold her. There's times I literally have to say, okay, Mazzy, I'm about to put you down. <laughs> yeah, she just loves me. And I just love her. And I think anybody that has any kind of PTSD, depression, I think animals are great for that. How did your day-to-day -day schedule change before amp the amputations and after? Before I got sick, I was, uh, I worked 40 hours a week, sometimes more. I was working in accounting at a big company and 
I was, you know, working full time, but I was also full time mom and we did sports and we did Friday night lights and then we did basketball and volleyball and softball. And so I was always on the go. After the amputations, I became a hermit. I stayed at home. I didn't want to, I guess I didn't want people to stare at me. And because I became a hermit, I did get depressed. But then when I started doing things for myself, I started to lift myself up. And I don't know. It's all kind of, it's, it's hard sometimes. What is it? What is that? What's he doing? And I don't know why, but I have talked to her in a baby voice. You have to. I know. And for some reason, you talk to her in a baby voice. I would think it's weird if you didn't. <laughs> Just say hi, Mazzy. How much time do you spend together each day? All day, every day. All day, every day. And at night, she comes and gets under the bed. Or she comes and gets on the bed. And she'll get up there and she'll lay beside me until we raise the cover up. When we raise the cover up, she crawls underneath it. What is the most important thing for other people to know about life as a quadruple amputee? I hate it when people stare at me. I understand they're curious and they want to know. Um, I would really rather people just come up and say, wow, can you tell me what happened? You're doing amazing. You know, you're walking and you're able to function and take care of yourself. Um, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm just missing some limbs. What happened? Um, it was actually on my birthday on October 10th. 2019, I went in and had nerve decompression surgery done on the back of my head. And I didn't know it, but it was a daytime surgery. So they sent me home and I had drain tubes hanging out of my head and everything. And um, I was doing fine. And then on October 22nd, I woke up and I was so sick, extremely sick. And I called the surgeon and he said well go to the emergency room and just have them check you out so my mom is the one that actually took me to the emergency room and I don't remember anything else after that um all I know is when we got to the hospital our local hospital here they said nope we can't handle this and they care flighted me to Dallas and I was put into a medically induced coma and I stayed in the coma for 13 or 14 days before I woke up. I, I joke all the time and I'm like, you know, I've never been in an airplane or a helicopter or anything like that. And I'm like, my first time to ride in a helicopter, I was unconscious for it. I don't even remember it. I'm like, that just stinks. <laughs> Did your whole family go in the emergency helicopter ride? No, they just took me only. Okay. Yeah. And everybody else drove up to everybody Dallas? Everybody else had to drive up to Dallas, yeah. Do you know exactly what happened? Um, they finally told us that on one of the stitches on the main incision on the back of my head tested positive for strep and it got in my bloodstream and ran rapid, caused me to go septic. At first they thought it was meningitis, um, but then the CDC, I guess, was trying to figure it out as well and they came back and said it was one stitch that tested positive for strep. And it went into the blood and I went toxic. They actually diagnosed me with toxic shock syndrome. I hadn't even thought about how this happened and then your kids went away to college shortly mm -hmm. after. Um, and I, I'm sure as a parent, as your kids are growing up, you're starting to think about getting your independence back and them going away to college and you having freedom. Yes, and it's different because I'm like, they're getting on, moving on with their lives. This is when me and my husband should start to get on with our lives. And, you know, we had always wanted to, to you know, travel or do something, you know, uh, not travel big, but like go to Florida to the beach for a week or something. And it's not that easy just to go anymore. Um, honestly, it's really not... We're really not able to do it at all. Uh, we don't have any way to transport this wheelchair. Um, and it can't ride in the back of a truck. And he has a truck and I have a little car. Um, 
So we, you know, those plans were kind of squashed. Just for context, so the audience can fully understand, we're in a rural part of Texas where there are other people might not see disabled people too much. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. If I go to Walmart, there's not very many disabled people in there. <laughs> it's mostly me. Every once in a while, I'll come across, you know, another disabled person. And, you know, I've, I've come across um, a man in the store that, that had lost his arm. And so... I'll literally just go up and ask him and say, you know, can I see your prosthesis? How are you learning to adapt with it? But for the most part, I'm usually the only one. What's that like? It's weird. Um, I guess it is. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I, for the longest time, didn't want to leave my house. Um... So I'm, I'm slowly venturing out, going to Walmart with my husband or with my mom. or going out to eat. Before I was a hermit, I was like, I ain't leaving my house. People stare at me. I'm a freak. I'm getting better, though. Sometimes I think, okay, their kids are going on with their lives. You know, they have significant others and at some point I'm going to be a grandma. Am I going to be able to hold a baby? Am I going to be able to feed a baby? Am I going to be able to take care of it? And those were all things that I was looking forward to. And then uh, I thought, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to watch my own grandkid. Then my son had a little friend come over and she had a baby. And it was just like second nature. Just pick that baby up and I'm holding her and I'm playing with her. And, you know, was, I asked her, I said, are you nervous at all about me holding her or anything? And she said, no, you got mom instincts. You're good. And I was like, I can do this. When my children have children, I will be able to hold my grandbaby and feed my grandbaby and things like that. So at first I was like, can't do it. There must have been just such the moment, though, that uncertainty just fading away and realizing I'm going to be able to hold my grandchildren. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not looking for grandchildren anytime soon. They're only 21. But knowing that I can hold a baby, I can do this, then it just brought that hope back that, you know, if, if one of my children calls up and you know, five, six years, hey, I need a babysitter to watch my kids. I'll be like, yeah, bring them over. I can do it. I can chase them around, you know. I can, you know, pick them up. I can feed them. It was, it felt really good when she brought her baby over and I was able to hold her. You must have a unique viewpoint to go from somebody without a disability to somebody with one at 40 years old. Have you realized anything about the way society treats people with a disability? Yeah, they treat us differently. They, and it's sad to say, you know, that, and I, and I was probably one of those people. I would see somebody with a disability and I would look and I would wonder. Um, and now being on the other end of that, I'm like, quit looking and staring at me. I'm just a person. Nothing different about me except for I don't have hands or I don't have legs. I had some friends that have kind of backed away. Because they don't know how to interact with me now. And that really hurts my feelings. Um, there's things that, you know, we would go and do before that I don't get to go and do with them anymore. Because they don't ask. Because they don't know how to be around me now. And that hurts. What advice would you give them? I'm still the same person. I'm the same person I was before I got sick. As I am now. I'm just a little bit different. You know, uh, we used to go out to lunch before. We can still go out to lunch now. I have, you know, adapt. I have braces that I put on that allow me to eat. I can still do it. Nothing's changed. And I know I keep harping on that, but nothing's changed. I'm still me. Yeah, it's just an actual wrist brace. Literally. That's a cool little accommodation you found out. Yeah. I just uh, put my arm in it. And then it's got the openings for like your thumbs or your fingers or whatever. I just stick the fork in there. Perfect. Yeah. 
that sound great. I'm going to brush my hair, stick the brush underneath it. Brush my teeth. All by using a simple wrist brace. How much did these amputations impact your own identity of who you are? A lot. Before I got sick, my hair was always done, my makeup was always perfect. Um, you know, rings and watches and bracelets. That was who I was. I was a very blingy person, I guess. You know, I always wanted to, to look good. I mean, I was going to work in a corporate office and I wanted to look good. Um, after the amputations, I can't straighten my hair. I can't curl my hair. Uh, I can put makeup on, but it's not very pretty. <laughs> so that was, and I know that's vain, but that's who I was. When I got discharged from the hospital, I was a lot smaller than what I am now. The medicine that they put me on has made me gain 50 pounds. Does that have a mental impact? Yes. Yes. I'm like, I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, look at this double chin or look at this belly, you know? I mean, I didn't like that. I don't like that, but I'm getting better of like, eh, I'm <laughs> going to be on this medication for the rest of my life because it controls the nerve pain. So... I hope you can find some grace for yourself. I mean, given the situation, I think that it's necessary. Some what? Some dreams? Some um, grace. Oh, grace. Yeah. Just some kindness for yourself, you know? Yeah. Like I said, it, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Is it tough? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. Um... But then I have to remind myself that I'm here for a reason. I just realized that we're in Texas and we're literally like at the end of a dirt road. It's very rural, right? Yeah. Um, it might not be the most accessible place to live for someone in your situation. What is it like living here? It's hard living here. Um, obviously, you can look at my house. It's not very wheelchair accessible. My husband had to adapt it. I mean, we, we live in a double wide, so we had to put a ramp, build the ramp so I could get into the house. Um, if I wanted to go and, and increase my endurance by walking, I can't do that out there because it's all gravel and one wrong, <laughs> one wrong rock and I go down. Just to kind of get rid of some of the uncertainty for friends you've had in the past who might want to reach out. What would going out to dinner look like with you today? It would look like going out to dinner with anybody. Um, I'll walk into the restaurant and sit down at the table and, you know, I can, you know, read the menu. I can order my, my entree, my drink, and I'm able to... Is it okay if we show your legs? Yeah. This is, it's actually very old, but it is called an AFO. So you can see it's got a toe feeler. So, and then my residual foot sits right there. And this is an AFO. Yeah, this is called an AFO. And so that's how it sits in the shoe. And then this is just my prosthetic leg. And so every day when I have to put this on, I have to pull the liner out. And you have to get the line lined up just right. Because if you don't, then it's not going to fit into the brace. So you just stick the liner on and then you just stick my leg on, click it in, and there you go. I've heard a few people, of my friends who've um, had limbs amputated, tell me, I think the term they used was like ghost limbs. You can still kind of feel Phantom pain. Phantom, yeah. Yes, yeah. I can, <laughs> I can sit there and, okay, I can do it right now. On this hand, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing that, all five of my fingers are wiggling like you so wiggling. So you can, you can feel it just like yeah, that. Just like that. Just like you just did. I can do that. You know, I'll get a cramp in my toe and I'll be like, oh my gosh, my toes hurt. And my husband's like, you don't got toes. <laughs> yes, I do. You just can't feel them or see them. Well, that's a good point. Do you ever, like, wake up at night and kind of have to recalibrate and remember everything that's transpired? 
Yeah, there's been, uh, for instance, one night I woke up and I had to go to the bathroom and my brain didn't compensate that I didn't have any legs. And so I just stood up and then I went down real quickly and realized, oh yeah, hello, you can't do that. You don't have any legs. But there's times where, you know, I have to get out of bed. I literally have to stop for a minute and go, okay, you either got to get in the wheelchair or put your legs on. What is it like learning to walk after an amputation? When I first put the prosthesis on, it was painful. Um, when they first fitted me, I was in the hospital and they took me into this room and there was two rails on each side. And they said, we're gonna put you in this prosthesis and we want you to stand up. And I was saying, well, there's no way I can stand up. I don't have, I, there's no way I can hold on to anything. I don't have any hands. And so I had a, um, a therapist on one side and a therapist on the other side while I was in the hospital and they stood me up on that prosthesis leg and it was excruciating. I just said, nope, can't do it and collapsed down and started crying. It's like as I came home and I was very, very depressed. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was, you know, close to taking my life. Um, and then one day I just fell upon my knees and I said, God, you got to help me. I, I can't do it. And uh, I had a prosthetic leg and my AFO brace. And I was sitting on the couch and I put them on. And I said, I can do this. I can walk. And I stood up and I walked from the couch to the other side of the living room and back. And every day I just kept increasing my distance.